Thanks, Tim. Good afternoon, everyone. I think I'm between you and lunch, so we've got a quick uh, flyby here of what, the way we're thinking about changing the, uh, the energy equation and some of the things that's go, that are, are going on at HP. So one of the things we hear about as an IT industry, and those of us that have big data centers and are serving up web services, uh, get criticized for the power and cooling and the energy consumption that those data centers have. We as an industry need to be responsible and we need to continue to improve our carbon footprint relative to the data centers and infrastructure, including the PCs and all the printers and other uh, products that are involved in information technology infrastructure and giving people access. But if we solve that completely, we will only have solved 2% of the problem. So while we'll continue to make progress and we'll continue to focus on making all of our technology more efficient, we think the most interesting thing we can do is use information technology to address that other 98%. So it was discussed in the previous session. It was kind of a nice setup for what I want to talk about, which is how we can use IT to improve our carbon footprint and at the same time you know, help people improve their business performance. So we kind of think about it in three ways transparent, efficient, and light, and I'll talk about it in those three contexts. We had a crisis earlier backstage. It's really a high-tech piece of gear that failed on us, which was the clicker, so we're, uh, I think, working again. Transparent really has to do with you can't manage what you can't measure, and you can't measure what you can't see. So it's really about you know, getting more information about energy consumption and energy use. Some of what we're doing, and if I can get the clicker to work, this gives you a feel at HP for some of the challenges we have. We ship two PCs every second, two printers every second, a server every 15 seconds. These are all really big numbers. And what that means is we have a huge supply chain, which takes a lot of energy to run. It also has a lot of partners involved. And one of the things we've done is we've really and this has to do with this transparency issue. We've really worked with our supply chain partners to develop baselines. Some of it has to do with a code of conduct, which we led along with some other industry partners, and then baseline people's carbon footprints so we can progressively measure when we've made progress. We're going to be one of the first IT companies to share all of our tier one supply chain partners and, and their greenhouse gas emissions. And by 2012, we'll have 75% of our supply chain, which is the largest supply chain in the industry, reporting on these key indicators. So it'll be transparent, and then we can work towards progressive improvement relative to our greenhouse gas footprint. One of the interesting applications, and this gets into using information to make better decisions, is something we've done with Detroit Water and Sewage. This is the third largest utility in the nation. And this gets into this really highly distributed network of information sources where we put information sensors into their system and we can get real-time feedback every five minutes on usage of water, tying the source all the way back to the billing system so that the utility company can completely view the supply chain that they're providing to the customers and then give the customer insight into how they can change their usage patterns so that the, the overall system will be more efficient. And we've already used this to get gains of as much as 15% just in this one utility application. Efficient. Energy you can use more resourcefully. So a number of things we're doing, this gets back to the, my earlier comments on these big powerful data centers. We're putting a new trade data center in Winard in the UK. And the nice thing is on this one we were able to start from ground zero. So this is a greenfield approach. And we did a lot of things really, uh, I think, differently than we've done in the past as an industry. Uh, we, we're going to take advantage of the entire system and collect rainwater off the roof and use that for cooling the system as well as, as irrigating the surrounding grounds. 
And then we're going to open up the data center walls and use the North Sea winds to cool the data center. So using a lot of naturally available resources. You see this with other people who are uh, locating data centers next to hydroelectric facilities. This is just taking it one step further and what we'll have is a 40% energy cost reduction and probably one of the most efficient and certainly one of the largest data centers in Europe. So a lot of things we can do as we just use technology and information and be very creative about how we take advantage of the resources that are available. We're looking at large scale systems and one of the best ways to do that is to think small. So nanotechnology is one of our areas of research. We have one of the few remaining industrial research labs and this last year we were recognized for uh, the invention of the memristor which is the fourth uh, circuit element and basically the way to think about it is it's, uh, it's a um, circuit that can retain state. So basically we can embed these sensors which are self-powered in a highly distributed system and we'll get networks where we get billions of sensors giving us feedback about the environment that we're in and I'll talk about how this relates to uh, bigger problems later on. Light. This gets into where we really need to have breakthrough technologies. I thought these were interesting statistics. 191 terawatt hours. So this is how much power we're going to use in, in the server world in 2012. It's enough power to power all of Mexico in 2007. Which tells us we need to fundamentally work on the architectures for servers and improve the power consumption there. So one of the best ways to do that, and the nice thing about this is this not only addresses power consumption, but it, it'll, it will help us address performance issues and, and give us the ability to continue uh, with the, the advancement of performance based on Moore's law. So moving to photonics, Obviously, we're not going to be mining as much copper, and it runs very cool, totally different uh, power consumption profile. And we'll have annual savings by introducing photonics into the back planes and the interconnect technology and at the board level and then on into the chip level of three, 13 terawatt hours of electricity. At the server and chip level, 110 terawatt hours of electricity. and we're going to continue to reduce the need to go after minerals that are hard to mine and, and inefficient. So photonics will give us the ability to not only compute at the speed of light, but do it without creating a lot of heat and using anywhere near as much power. This gives you a feel for, and this is I think data that everybody's very aware of, how much we increase our carbon footprint when we travel in traditional modes. One of the things that's helping a lot with that is true immersive virtual reality kind of collaboration tools. So our Halo video conference system gives you the, the ability to have a real time, real life experience in a meeting setting without getting on that airplane and flying to London or to Beijing or wherever you have to go. We've introduced a whole set of these tools at the next level down. So the Halo system is a very high-end, uh, limited experience because of the deployment constraints. You have to have a studio and, and uh, carefully uh, developed sound and video technology. We've taken what we've learned at the high end and we're, we just introduced that this month on our workstations in a system called Skyroom, which gives you the ability to do that from your desktop. And that'll give you a continuous experience from your desktop all the way to a very high-end virtual reality kind of system with Halo. One of the interesting things is thinking creatively about how to not do certain things. So this is a system that we co-developed with one of our customers, UPS. And basically, it eliminated a lot of the process by simply removing the need to print labels. 1,338 tons of paper 
are used every year just for labels. So what this device does is it reads a little bit of information off the package and then dire prints directly on the package the new tracking information that's required to send that package to where it needs to go for the next step. No label is required, no paper consumed, and we're doing this with environmental friendly ink technology. Then we get into some of the stuff that we all know and love. Great. Um, magazines. There's an incredible amount of waste in the magazine in industry today. So 2.3 billion is a lot of magazines that are never touched and never actually purchased. We have just introduced a new web service called MagCloud. What it does is it gives you the ability as either an amateur or a professional to publish your own magazine. You can personalize it and publish it on the web. And it's never printed until somebody decides to buy it. And then it's sh shipped through a print service provider within about 48 hours, because the print service providers is a distributed network that's typically located somewhere close to where you, you are and that will be shipped directly to you when you've purchased it. So there will be no waste whatsoever. We just announced a, a deal today, actually, with the University of Michigan for the same concept in the book world. So we'll have 500,000 out-of-print books available that will not be printed unless there's a customer who's actually going to purchase that book. And MagCloud just announced a partnership with, uh, with Wikipedia to allow people to take that content and turn it into customized magazines and publish them on the MagCloud service. So I'm going to run a quick video to give you a, a better Mag feel for this. MagCloud is a new web service from HP that allows anyone with content to publish and sell a commercial quality magazine printed on demand. There is an explosion of content available on the web and readers are demanding customized choices that match their interest around the content they consume and how they consume it. Using the web and digital print-on-demand technology, MagCloud dramatically simplifies the publishing process, making it available to anyone. No pre-publication expense, and also no waste, since a magazine is printed only when it's purchased. HP's MagCloud is democratizing the print publishing industry and enabling new cost-efficient and lucrative business models for independent magazine publishers, while at the same time providing traditional print publishers with new ways to reach their audiences without giving up the beauty and permanence of print. If you get interested in magazine publishing for any purpose, uh, I'd encourage you to try that one out. So what's next? I talked about embedding sensors in the rest of the world. Again, sustainable cities using information in the right place, in the right hands at the right time to make better decisions about how to, how to really provision and reprovision all the utilities that we use in, the, in a sustainable city environment. So in summary, energy is just one of the issues, but it's a very important issue. Information will be the most precious commodity of the next century. This is something we all know and live in this world, but most people really haven't completely internalized that yet. And information technology will be the key to really addressing that other 98% of the greenhouse gas footprint that we don't control within the IT community. So with that, thank you very much. I know it was a fast flyby.